Well, I guess now we'll just sort of jump into it. I'm here with Terry Thompson, theserialhobbyist.com, but there's two hyphens in there. Today we're here to talk about a particular article that really hit home for me, Corporate America, the biggest pyramid scheme in the world. We're not going to worry about any kind of acoustics in the background. We're not in the studio. We're here at Terry's home where he Terry does. I'm looking at a, a fireplace right now, a mantle that's being dismembered. And I remember seeing the post the other day about uh, weathered wood or natural. Yes. What's the consensus been so far? Mm -hmm. The consensus has been about 98% votes for weathered. Yeah. And I got a couple stragglers in there for, for the natural. So uh, I think I'm going to keep going with the weathered and the best part about doing it yourself is if you don't like it, tear it all down, do it again. Awesome. Now, and you're definitely capable of doing that. Let's jump into this. If you read the article, there's a fun disclaimer in the front. <laughs> and uh, that's for the folks primarily who are in the, you know, who are in the corporate world. Yeah. And maybe since I love how you say this, uh, as always, sensitive people are free to spend their time reading someone else's blog. That's right. A macro view for maybe somebody who doesn't, uh, who's not going to listen to this. I don't know. We don't have a time frame, but how long we want to have this doesn't really matter. The flow is you pretty much, you, you go into, mm -hmm. I had this feeling since I was in middle school, could never really put a voice to it. And now I'm 34, you're 34 years old, the article says. Mm -hmm. um, you've been in, uh, in this oil and gas industry for nine years, particularly in this particular company. Is that right? Uh, I've been with two companies. Two companies, okay. And you basically start developing the concept of now I know what this is. Yes. I, I, I identified it and this is, what, this is exactly what it is. And then you just, you go full bore into what it is and then deconstructing this this paradigm that so many folks are not even aware of. Mm -hmm. A lot of us have ideas that are brewing over time. Some of them never give voice, never get identified in terms of there's never cohesion. Mm -hmm. What has this done for you? As you, as you wrote this article, uh, did you find that it was just part of a natural progression of the way that you think in your life and patterns of how they, how they unfold for you? Or was this like an aha moment is it something that sort of makes sense to you now that you've it's sort of been working itself in the background? Is it something you were particularly saying, I'm going to find a solution for this thought mm. that I've had or what's going on? What has this done for you, as you as, since the time that you wrote it and you published it? So this particular article um, really came from a place of, I know I'm not the only one. It comes from a place of remembering how over the past nine years of working in corporate America, I go to lunches with coworkers and friends and we talk about how much we hate the grind and how we wanna all break out on our own but we don't know what to do, how this isn't the life that we thought we were going to live when we were in college. It's not the dreams and the hopes that we had when we were kids. This isn't, this isn't the American dream because we wake up in the morning at every day. We know exactly what we're gonna do every Tuesday morning. We're gonna wake up at 6 a.m. We're gonna go sit in traffic for an hour and a half. Then we're gonna go sit in our cubicle until 11.30. At 11.30, we're gonna go to, the, to the, the, the food court for lunch and we're gonna complain about being in corporate America and talk about our hopes and dreams. And then we're gonna set those hopes and dreams to the side for the next six hours. We're gonna go back to work. And then we're going to work till five o'clock, at which point we get off work and then we go sit in traffic for another hour and a half. We get home, we see our kids for about an hour, maybe take them to soccer practice, bring them home, give them a bath, put them to bed, then hit repeat the next day. And we do that five days a week for the next 40 years. And we accept that as success and we call it success, but we all know that it's not. Anyone who has done it knows that it's not. And you feel that it's not but you don't really know what other options are out there. You don't have any other options, so you do it. Okay, so let me, let me sort of challenge that thinking here because a lot of times when we have ideas challenged or we think about stuff you know, we hear something presented a different way, it gives depth to what we think or maybe we transition some Absolutely. things. Absolutely. So from a, from a very basic moral imperative or, or a liability, I think is something you would said either in an article or on a phone call mm -hmm. when we have obligations. At a very basic level though, being able to stick with something and adapt to that pattern could be termed very simply a success, couldn't it? Absolutely, and I think it, it all depends on where your hopes and dreams lie. And I think a lot of this paradigm that, that I'm attempting to shift in my own life and, and attempting to help people realize through this article is that a lot of us grew up, we are the product of our parents and our parents were the products of their parents and their parents were the product of probably the two most significant events in American history, the Great Depression and World War II. 
both of which basically decimated the American dream, just absolutely destroyed it. And our grandparents came out of that, and their hopes and dreams were to provide a stable, ongoing income for their family. And that, that was their hope and dream because they lived in a world that did not have that. And they were able to live that dream by getting going to college, getting a degree, getting a good job that would pay them a, a solid wage until they were 60, 70 years old. And our parents grew up under that tutelage. And so they lived that dream. And but they grew up, you know, our parents grew up through the 60s, 70s and into the, the, the huge prosperity of the 80s and the boom of the 90s but they were still living the lifestyle of the Great Depression. And a lot of us can relate to that, man. We grew up and we weren't poor by any means. We had, you know, I, I, I never even found out my dad was as wealthy as he was until I was grown up and gone because I always had hand-me-down clothes and shopped at Goodwill and, you know, that's just how life was. But then here we are, this next generation that's now, quote unquote, middle-aged and in the workforce. And we grew up in a different era. We did not grow up in the Great Depression. We're not children of the mentality of I just need stability. We're children of the 80s, children of the 90s who grew up in a time of prosperity where hopes and dreams were more than just working until you were 70 years old and, and holding a steady job. Our hopes and dreams were that we could become anything that we wanted to be. That's what we were told growing up. But then we grew up enough to the point where we actually needed to have a, an income and we turned to our parents and we said, hey, how do we get an income? And what do you think they said? Well, you go to college, you get a, get a degree, and then you get a stable job and work until you're 70. And we said, okay. But we don't live in that world anymore. We live in a very different world. We live in a world of technology, of information, where businesses are not something that you have to start with a factory. They can start from a click on the internet. And we live in a very different world than our parents did. And, and, but we haven't fully shifted away from that mindset yet. We're still in the mindset of the Great Depression, but we're living in the age of prosperity and information. Yeah. Well, that's powerful. You, you mentioned something that uh, a, a point that can be challenged about the World War II. The American dream was completely destroyed. What aspect of the American dream are you referring to being completely destroyed? So the American dream, I believe, was in, in a lot of ways destroyed during the Great Depression. And then World War II took that American dream. And that was kind of like it took the dregs of what the Great Depression had destroyed. Which and is it, prosperity, which is coming here for land of opportunity yes anything i mean there's uh, milk and honey flowing right mm -hmm. great depression pretty much stomped all over that and then world war ii happened and world war ii said you know what we've been through the great depression we've been through hard times we've been through persecution and and the world is in utter turmoil and you know what we're still going to cling to the dregs of that american dream and we're going to make it happen again and so world war ii kind of was that turning point where it said okay we're going to survive this. We're going to make it happen. We're going to make it through this great depression and this great turmoil. And we were able to accomplish that. And so after all of that, after seeing the great depression, after seeing the turmoil, the American dream in and of itself was still preserved, but it was pre preserved in a very different way. It was preserved in the, in the sense of the dream of stability versus the dream of, of success as we we well, would define it now i just thought of something that's pretty amazing a parallel or something as a, a an ideological point or reference that you're talking about world war ii ended in what 1945 to 48 right you had the destabilizing of all the the, the evil axes stuff that was right before we have the 60s we have the beatles mm -hmm. we have this whole revolution of free love a stark contrast to the the stability and the reconstruction that was happening by the parents of the kids who would grow up in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. But we also have the 60s and 70s. So that whole time frame, number one, psychologically, I've been studying this for quite a bit of years, and I don't want to I don't want to detract from what we're going here with this, but there's a salient point that's undershadows everything here, or overshadows, whichever one it is. Propaganda, the use of propaganda yes. in, in marketing and ideas, and what we see in the 60s and 70s, the United States military and I'm not definitely not making this political, we're just speaking factual here, because it runs along the lines of what you're talking about here. When we look at this, the, the investment in psychological operations and research that was done from a military perspective in the US, 
I mean, we have the great race to space in the 60s with the Russians. We have mm -hmm. the communist scares in the 50s. Mm -hmm. we, we have, and if you, if you watch, like me, a knucklehead, I'm, I'm watching a couple years ago, I got stuck on, someone turned me on to Mad Men okay. um, about advertising and, and the, the sex appeal of people that were influencing our, our desires by selling us and telling us what we wanted. And so we go to where we're at now, advertising and marketing has become so invasive Mm -hmm. And I think that you're s – so there's these points that you're touching on here that I, I would recommend anybody who's listening to this podcast or listening to this audio, if they haven't done any research, go and under begin understanding what is what is real estate, but it's brain space. It's basically – it's it's what the marketing dollars are after when they're advertising to us on ads, on TV, on the internet, on our phones, uh, mobile, whatever. It would, it would do well for anybody to go through and just do a real quick understanding of what is propaganda. It's a very loaded term, but basically advertising and any kind of marketing message that's trying to influence behavior of the end user it can be termed propaganda, mm -hmm. and that's what advertising stuff. So go, going back to this, so now we're in a point of we have tremendous prosperity. Technology, like I didn't have my first computer until I got married with Maria and mm -hmm. she had a computer and I was like, what is this? I'm going to break it. I don't, <laughs> I was seriously worried about, I was like that guy that called 911 or the lady that called 911 and the guy says, what's your emergency? And she says, I'm afraid to move my mouse because I'm on the edge of the table. It's right near the edge and I'm, I'm, and I'm afraid that I need to move the cursor over a little bit more <laughs> and I'm afraid it'll drop off the screen. <laughs> I don't want to break anything, right? I was sort of like this lady. <laughs> what I love about your mind and how you work is that you're you're one of these people that to me actually has depth and dimension to it. There's the, you don't I don't see you as at least so far as as long as I've known you, you've never been somebody to give an answer just to give an answer. There's right. always underlying principles and laws and 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 reason to it. There's some there's some sarcasm in here. Quite the dream, right? And there's later on you say, uh, where can I sign up? Mm -hmm. The single more most important thing that you realize what you say is that America, a corporate America, is the biggest pyramid scheme in the world. And you say, behold the great pyramids of America. You specifically mentioned Exxon Mobil or McDonald's, but you start talking about structure. You go from presidents to executives down to directors, managers, supervisors, and then the actual the workforce who are upon whose backs most of the labor is, is positioned. And that's through experience that you've had. You talk about having good bosses and bad bosses. Yes. During this whole process, has there been – have you been creating a world and a, a universe as you've been going through this process over the years, being in the workforce, you know, being in college, uh, you know, having a family of Terry's world of, of, of really who, ha what kind of existence you're going to design for yourself and for your family and for your work? Did you envision walking away from a traditional job? Uh, have you been working on that in your head for years? Because I know I have, and I sort of see, I sort of see hints of that here, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that is definitely the ultimate dream. Now, it's, it's one thing to say, I'm gonna walk away from a job. It's another thing to actually do it and survive. And so, because of that, I think that it's very important that when you decide that you have a goal, you need to have a realistic plan of how to get there. I can't say I'm going to fly into outer space and then walk outside and jump and hope that I'm gonna fly out of the atmosphere. You know, I need to have expectations that I'm going to go become, study to become an astronaut. I'm going to take, take advantage of technology. I'm going to, you know, go get a job with NASA. I'm going to train. I'm going to train physically, mentally, emotionally. And then eventually, at some point, I'm going to be able to be an astronaut that flies out into outer space. Same way with understanding that at some point, I'm going to walk away from corporate America. I've embedded myself so deeply in it in, over these past nine years and created so many liabilities, financial liabilities for myself that I have right now that I can't, I literally cannot walk away at this very moment without completely folding in every other aspect of my life. But I'm in the process of developing a realistic plan of how to get there as quickly as possible. Yeah. And that's why I want to get this information out to people especially people who are in college, graduating college at this point, because at this point, when if I could rewind, get rid of all these liabilities that I now have 10 years later, and go back and try to have this mindset without those liabilities, I think to myself, man, it would have been so much easier to, to get where I wanna be and get there quickly if I could have started this path a long time ago. So let's just sort of mention some liabilities because for those of us who are married and have kids or we have families, we have children, we've gone through the whole role of raising other human beings, right? Mm -hmm. 
probably the biggest liability we talk about because I was with a company, a large corporation, a really, a really dear friend of mine, you know, recruited me for this job and I was, I was making more money every week than I ever had as an employee. Mm -hmm. And I walked away from that. And so it's somewhat sobering to hear this from you because if I could go back to that time in my life, I would have told myself, David, stick with this, make a plan and work this plan before you exit, you know, make sure you have this parachute tested before you just jump out on your own. The only point I would contend with is that um, we're all going to survive. The question is, you know, what level of comfort can we maintain? Yes. And so, I mean, because I, I know you're, uh, I have no, I have no doubt if there's anybody that could make something out of nothing or something with like a MacGyver, it would be you. <laughs> so, you know, because all the stuff that you do and there's so, there's so, so much depth to you. It's, it's really inspiring. So let's sort of hit this corporate structure you talk about. So you basically set up what a pyramid is. And so the pyramid, you have a square at the base and then, uh, or a quadrilateral geometric shape mm -hmm. and all these sides eventually meet together, unite at the top, at the, at the top of the pyramid. And traditionally the worker, the working class forms the largest populace of this pyramid. Yes. Right. And then goes up. And as you reduce now, what's interesting about this is that the skill set follows the availability of the populace there. So the skill set, easier, more easily acquired skills are on the bottom. Yes. Take less skills to, to do these things or less uh, investment of time and training. But as you go higher up the pyramid, there's a, there's a, there's a, a scarcity of skill sets, right? There are specialties, mm -hmm. specializations. So you mentioned you hit it pretty hard there when you talk about the wage. And one of the things you say with the CEOs, presidents and owners, this person makes an ungodly wage mm -hmm. and probably doesn't have to worry too much about money. I, I would agree with that completely. But your use of the adjective ungodly points me to some very strong opinions about what a fair wage would be for a CEO, president. And, and, and you didn't go into that here. Right. Maybe that's another article. Right. Do you really think that, because I could argue that the person at the top of the skill set, at the top of the pyramid, has a very heavy burden that they're directing the, the pyramid below it. Absolutely, yeah. How would you even go about approaching what would be a fair wage? At that point, I mean, given the corporate structure, if they have had the grit and the know-how and the skill set to get to that point, and, and in some cases the sheer lifespan to get to that point, then I think they should make an ungodly wage. Now, that's not to say I necessarily enjoy the pyramid structure, and I don't want to be a part of the pyramid structure. That's the point I was getting at, but exiting it. Yeah, I don't want to be a part of it, but for the people who do want to be a part of it, who do see that as their dream, and they want to be at the point at the top of that pyramid, then good for them. Then good for them. If, if they are capable of getting there and successful in getting there, then they should make all the money in the world. Yeah, and then that's what you start hitting on when you go in there and you say, you, you start from, it's a small handful of people, and then, you know, people are vying, and I love this, because you use this repeatedly here, their odds aren't very good considering there are far more of them than there are open positions, so scarcity of opportunity. Mm -hmm. So they fight and stand on each other's heads to prove that they are better than the rest of the, you know, executives, supervisors, directors, managers, uh, whatever, and should be selected. But what's interesting, you used earlier the NASA comparison. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was on my mission in Utah, uh, there was an elder there, uh, one of their missionaries, ridiculously talented, music, um, brilliant, rugged, good looks, charismatic, athletic, and uh, he said he was going to be an astronaut. And I remember telling him, like, I thought he was full of himself, first off. He spoke like four or five languages. Just I felt like he grew up really privileged and we just grew up on a different side of the world. What's interesting is I didn't know that you can do everything you want, but if you're too tall or your body doesn't fit the, the pattern, you're not gonna get in. Yep. You'll be placed somewhere else in a supportive role, but you'll be placed there. And that's what you mentioned, that's, that's what you're pointing out with this here is that, and you just said it, if that's what you want, if you can get through that, but there's a passivity that, you know, that, that when you go into the, the, uh, the MLM structure, mm -hmm. doesn't exist there. That's absolutely right, and, and that's what, I'm not, I'm not discouraging people from going into corporate America. What I'm trying to do is help them understand what they're getting themselves into. If you want to enter that structure and you want to be that guy that schmoozes and networks and climbs up the ladder to the top and you want to put your future in somebody else's hands and hope that you get selected to get there and outlast the people around you, if that's what you want and that's, what, that's your thing, then by all means chase that dream. 
I'm not trying to hold anybody back from their dream, but I just want people to understand and take a moment and, and think, is that my dream? And if it's not, then maybe I should chase something else. Maybe I should redefine what I say is success. And that's, that's really the point of this article is that, you know, these people that have been very successful in corporate America, well, good for them, good for them. And I hope that's what they wanted to do. I hope that's what they wanted to accomplish in life. It's just not what I wanted to accomplish. I love how you, you say in there that uh, you realize you had spent more time at work than you had with your kids. Yes. All of us that go through that, some of us justify it by saying, well, look at the kind of life they live. Look at the kind of opportunities that my kids have, like for myself. Uh, my wife has put our kids in swim lessons and, and music lessons and things that I never had an opportunity to do. A trampoline in the backyard. My mother bought our kids this huge 14, 15 foot trampoline. She wouldn't even let us jump on a little Jane Fonda three foot trampoline when we were growing up because she didn't want us to get hurt. And here she is buying our kids two trampolines. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's great to have this, this opportunity here of consciousness. And what I love about your message, Terry, is there has to be a sense of nobility in or a, a sense of mission, a sense of purpose that you've connected with. And I think that's, it's apparent as I read this here, but I want to hear more about where did you get this from? Is it something, this sense of compassion? Because to think about, you mentioned earlier the college students who mm -hmm. are going to get a good job and they're, you know, going to have a great credit score and all sort of stuff. To me, you're, remind, you're reminding me of the crossing guard who's there. It's like, hey, guys, you know, the light's there. Traffic will stop. You can trust people. But I'm here to let you know, you know, you need help. I, I want you to understand, like, why would you take your time to let other people know, like, in, inform them, informed consent? It's like, hey, guys, I want you to be aware of what you're getting yourself into. Why would that matter to you? Man, so there, there's a real good question. There are different types of people in this world. I think the one thing that we all have in common is that we all seek a source of motivation. And there are people who seek motivation from people, and there are people who seek motivation from things. I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong. They just are what they are. Some people seek motivation from people and some people seek motivation from things. I fall into the first category. I seek motivation from people. The motivation for me to act and to do things is having the understanding that in some way, shape, or form, the actions that I'm taking are having a positive impact on an individual's life. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with understanding that the actions that you're taking are generating income or, or, or you know, accomplishing some other material goal. Uh, th there's a place for that. But granted that this blog is not currently making any income from me, maybe that'll change in the future, who knows. But right now, when you're dealing with information, I ask myself, if, if it takes me one hour to write an article, but if someone reads that article and it changes the course of their life, would that hour have been well spent? And to me, the answer every time is absolutely. And so if I can take an hour of, out of my day to help some college student who's trying to figure out what their hopes and dreams really are in this world, and has the entire world screaming at them that they need to get a good job because that makes them successful. And they see this article and they decide, well, maybe I need to take another look. If there's one person in the world that says that, then it was all worth it. Right on. That's, uh, oh man, that's great. I love it. There's so much I could say about that. But uh, so you, you go there, you talk about these different contributors, a level of contribution, the availability of certain positions, and then the limitation of, I like how you say this here, this last sentence here in this paragraph, you say, so they fight back, stab, talking about the individual contributors, they fight back, stab, brown nose schmooze, and stand on each other's heads to prove that they are better than the rest of the nameless employees and should be noticed enough to be placed in the pool of potential ladder climbers, hoping that someday, somehow, someone else, with that's capitalized, someone else, with some pull in the company will notice them and decide that they should get, get to have a future. So where do I sign up? Exactly. Right? And that's, that's really, that right there embodies the point of the article. And I think you can relate to this because we both serve church missions. When you're in the mission field and you've been out for almost two years, you've been acting as a missionary, you've been doing missionary work, you've been trained on all these things for 24 months, you, you know what you're doing. Essentially, we're, we're finding ways to serve people. Right. But you're good at it. Yeah. You've become proficient at it. And when new guys come in, you know, these are 19 year olds, you know, fresh out of high school. They're coming in, in trying, they're saying, yay, I'm going to be a missionary. And they don't have a clue what they're doing. They're standing exactly where you were standing two years before. 
stars in their eyes, you know, not really understanding how to talk to people. People skills could be a lot better. They got all the heart in the world, but they just don't really know what they're doing. And you as the experienced missionary are responsible for taking one of them under your wing and training them to do what you do, to, to pick up the skills that you have picked up. And the only way that you succeed in that role is by helping them succeed in their role. Now, let me ask you something. When you were a missionary, the greatest success, I know for me, the greatest success that I ever saw was when we were all working together to help each other succeed, and we all succeeded together. We elevated each other because we were trying to elevate the other person. And in the end, the work of sharing, in this case, the gospel, but you can translate that into terms of business, but in, in terms of sharing the gospel, more was done, more was accomplished, more people's lives were changed when we were all trying to help each other. Now transition that to corporate America, the structure that we have, where you go in as an underling, you're not even on the corporate ladder at first, but you're, you work your tail off long hours to try to get noticed, to try to beat the other people out so that somebody who's more experienced, who has a different skill set, who has more, more time in the company, can notice you and say, hey, out of all you little underlings, I like that one. And I think that in 30 years, he could be a potentially a good manager. And so I'm gonna kind of latch on to him and hope that, that it pans out. And I'm not really gonna worry about the other people. But there's a, there's a certain level that, uh, some of the pattern that we see with that and, and when we worked in those places is that individual has to be, in other words, they can't really threaten the well-being, like you mentioned in the article, about that individual who's willing to take a, take a chance and, and give this person an opportunity, right? Yeah help them reach the next level, whatever kind of corporate jargon we want to use. But understand there's a glass ceiling there. And as long as you stay in your place and you feed me the good ideas and make me look good, then I'll do what I can for you. Yes. Until you're not really of use to me anymore. And so you ask yourself, well, are you ever going to make more money than your boss? Now we're talking business. The answer is, well, no, there, there's a reason he's your boss. He's going to make more money than you. So how do you make more money than him. Well, you gotta become the boss. Okay, well, how do you become the boss? Well, there's a few ways to do that. Number one, you literally have to outlive him. So he like dies and then there's an opening, so you become the boss. Or you outlast him, so he retires at 70 years old and maybe by this point you're 55 years old and you become the boss. Or he gets fired because he wasn't a very good boss and then you're sitting there scratching your head saying, well, I." I got trained by this guy, so am I gonna be a very good boss? Because I received training under the mentorship of somebody who just got fired. And so you're, you're stuck in all these, these kind of dead-end positions. But there's, there's one you missed. Okay. If you slit his throat, if you outperform him and bump him off. And bump him off. And that would be, I guess, I would consider a demotion kind of on the oh, along the same lines as okay. being fired. Yeah because he is not performing, therefore he's let go from his position. And so in all of those, you're dealing with a mindset of, we're, there's no collaboration, there's no edification of each other, there's no collective uh, elevation. It's all, it, it's a zero sum game where if you're there, I'm not, and if I'm there, you're not. And we can't share the position together and we can't rise together. And there will always, in order for someone to rise, there have to be 10 people who fall. That's the way it works. That's the way the pyramid works. That's the way corporate America works. There will always be exponentially more people that fall for every one person who rises. And again, if you understand that and you're cool with that, fine, but I'm not. Yeah. Even without saying it, you're not really fine because by getting this information about out there, you want others to feel that level of discomfort and challenge the thinking. I mean, I, that's what I love about I'm really grateful that you started this blog because, I mean, it's fuel for me. I appreciate it. It gets me thinking about things I hadn't thought about and things in different ways, but it keeps me thinking. I mean, one of the biggest challenges, I think it's interesting that you said you have coworkers when you guys go to the food court and you talk about, it sounds like there's recurring themes here. You guys are pretty aware of what's going on, and so you're all sort of scheming and thinking, okay, well, how, what's our escape plan? I think about all these movies in the past, you know, Alca Escape from Alcatraz. Mm -hmm. I think you say that in the article, right? Uh, mm -hmm. There you go. Um, yeah, dig out with my spoon. With your spoon, right? Yep. I love, I thought of Monty Python when I see, uh, but before we grab our pitchforks and start screaming pyramid, and I'm thinking about the witch scene. Yes. Right? So now you start talking about, you, the metaphor you use is the redheaded stepchild. I don't, where did that come from? Is that from a novel or some book in history that? You know, that's something that I just, 
picked up in, in American jargon. I don't know what the origin is, but uh, yeah, it's a commonly used phrase from. from yeah, I, I've heard it for a long time. I just thought you might have the answer for that. Offhand. I don't. I don't. Because I mean, there's some there's some great looking redheaded girls that I've seen in my life, and I'm like, well, why would anybody want to? <laughs> Wendy's is a perfect example. The chocolate frosty. I love that thing. <laughs> Good old Dave Thomas. Okay. And I love how you anticipated where our mind is going to go with this because they say, let's take a look at a totally different type of business. And I can't help but laugh when I think when I, as I read that, I'm like, dude, what a great segue into what he's going to pitch. And then you say, you know, and, and just as a forward, this is not, capital not, a sales pitch to anyone. And so we're going to go in and start talking about MLM. Now, when were you first introduced to MLMs? Oh, gosh. I, I've been introduced to MLMs countless times in my life. When was the first time that somebody either came to you to recruit you or that you even found out such things existed? Uh, 21. Right after your mission? Yes. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and I have to say before that, because, and we can talk about it more once we've examined the MLM structure, but I would have to say that I had already been a part of an MLM for two years, just not a financial MLM. Okay, I see what you're saying, yeah. But I just didn't know it. Yeah. Because I had been so indoctrinated with the idea that the three letters MLM were bad, they were scary, they were Ponzi schemes, they were pyramids, they were, they were the assault rifle equivalent of the business world. Yeah. Not because they were anything different, just because they, were, they had a scary name, you yeah. know? You do a great job in talking about what an MLM is and debunking the actual untruths. And you actually spin it on its head to say, you know, people say that the MLM is this, this, and this. Well, actually, that's the perfect definition of what a pyramid is. That's exactly right. Right, just go ahead and hit that, go into that. Yeah, so people say, oh, well, the MLM, you know, you get in early and then you get all these, you recruit all these people underneath you and they recruit people underneath them. And, and then, you know, the bigger you can build your pyramid, you're sitting up at the top making all this cash and everybody else is doing all your volume and, and you know, working, doing all the work and you sit up there, you know, going on cruises. Well, that's a pyramid. Well, no. To me, that's called hard work in capitalism. A pyramid is when you are sitting at the bottom with no authority or control over your ability to move up and you're competing against the people next to you, and you're competing against the people around you, and there are fewer slots above you than there are people who want those slots. That's a pyramid, and that is called corporate America. And MLM's not that way. I if you really want to take examine the structure, an MLM is, is more like an upside down pyramid, where you are the point at the bottom, and the only place to go is up, because you can't go laterally. Literally, there is no structure for you to go laterally in an MLM. You either go up or you quit. It's the only two options. And the greatest part about it, and, and what, what I have come to understand, which took me 13 years to realize, and having been pitched the MLM model many, many times before I actually was humble enough to read what it was instead of just assuming my preconceived notions were correct, is that where else can you find a business where someone's success is fully dependent on how successful they can make you? Because I look at the person who sponsored me, and he has called me, texted me, worked with me, given up his own precious time to come study with me, sent me audio files, given me books, invited me to trainings, given me trainings. I mean, literally, this man has invested more time in, in the success of my life than any other boss I've ever had in my life. And you ask yourself, why? Why would he spend this much time and effort investing his own resources into me and my business? Well, the answer is simple. Because to the extent that he can help me succeed in the way that he has succeeded, he succeeds more. And literally, by him trying to make me the absolute best person and businessman that I can be, we elevate each other. And when I see that, it inspires me and makes me want to do the same for somebody else. Where else in business can you find a group of people who are maniacally trying to get other people to succeed. The more success that an individual has, the more success there is to go around. Tell me in corporate America where you have a boss who is dedicating his spare time outside of his normal 60 hours a week to come mentor you because he is dying to have you become successful like him. No, bosses are scared of you because if they make you too successful, guess what's gonna happen? You will become them and they're gonna be gone. There's no duplication in, in the corporate pyramid, but the MLM structure, because it's an upside down pyramid, it thrives on duplication. Yeah, right on, man. What you just described perfectly 
in an MLM structure, if we want to call it that, that upside down pyramid is actually what makes a, a family successful, isn't it? Absolutely. Empowerment. Right. While I was on vacation last week in, in Destin, I don't think it's in this notebook, it's a different one. I was working on two different ideas and, and I was having a hard time. One of them was entitlement and all I was doing this word cluster around the word entitlement. People feel that they are entitled to certain rights and privileges, that they deserve them just by simply existing. That's something you mentioned there, just, you know, get a paycheck just because you exist, right? Right. And I was having a hard time. I even went on a thesaurus on, on, online and I couldn't find the exact antonym or the opposing word that would sum up the opposite of entitlement. I, I would interject here and, and say, while it may not be a direct antonym in terms of concept, I would say the exact opposite of entitlement is responsibility. Yeah. You know, a lot of people think, oh, responsibility, that means like, you know, taking responsibility for something or admitting when you're wrong or something like that. But no, when you really understand the, the breadth of the word responsibility, it is entitlement and responsibility can't ex exist in the same space. I love it. The word, and so responsibility is on there. A accountability is another one. The word that actually came up and I was like, wait a second, empowerment, mm -hmm. right? And so entitlement versus empowerment. So when you're empowering somebody, and here's a funny story. My phone, this phone right here, well, not this phone. This is a life-proof case. Great product. I use it, shockproof, waterproof. And, uh, and then I also have a pouch that I carry our, our devices in so we can go underwater, like when we go to water parks and stuff. Short story is my phone, that I ended up taking it out of the case. I took it out of that bag. I got water in it unknowingly last week in Destin. T-Mobile said, yeah, you have insurance. Oh, by the way, you have to use Apple Care. We can't do anything. So you'll have to get it fixed when you get back to Houston. So I went the whole week without my phone. I get here to Houston on Sunday. I go on Apple's website, get an appointment with a genius for Tuesday that said, that's not going to work. I need my phone for work. So I accept that appointment. Nothing else is available nearby. Monday morning at seven o'clock, I go online. I see that there's, I can go to Memorial City. I have an appointment there at 1220. Go down there. I check in 40 minutes later. They don't call me. I'm like feeling something's off. So I go up to the guy I checked in with. I said, hey, uh, just want to check. And he goes, his name's Eric, by the way. And he says, uh, oh, Oh, somehow it got canceled. One of his coworkers oversaw what he was doing and she jumped in to try and help me out. And he goes, oh, somehow it got canceled. And so he walked away because he didn't want to get called out. I found out he's a new, new hire there. He goes to the big guy who's in charge there and I can see there's some rambling going on. He comes back to me and says, uh, well, you're on the list now to get seen. I'm like, okay, well, I've been here for 40 minutes. You know, do you have an idea? I can see you guys are busy. Do you have an idea? Because I, I, I sort of need my appointment. He goes, oh, I don't, but you'll be seen. Don't worry about it. So I ask him this. And I said, did you accidentally cancel my appointment? He goes, oh, and he just points to the, the device. He didn't want to take any accountability or remotely accept any kind of, a lady named Chandra, Sandra, who I met a second later, saw that. He walks away. She saw I was unhappy. I wasn't rude. Like some of the people that go in there are entitled. Apple, just the mentality of some of these folks, are ridiculous, like Amazon customers sometimes. She looks at him. She looks at me. She's probably about 20 years my senior. And she goes, you know the problem with that boy? And I didn't say anything, okay? She goes, the problem with that boy is he was raised by a mom who never taught him to take responsibility. So you said that word. I'm like, I'm thinking about Eric over there. I ended up getting help by a guy named David who was fantastic there. Replaced my phone, no questions asked. But that really stuck with me because I, I was sort of in this moral dilemma where I wanted to go talk to the manager and say, listen, I just want to give you some feedback. I don't work in corporate America. I'm at the vulnerability of, of, of projects. You know, I have my own business, but I want to give you this feedback and I hope it'll do something. But I really didn't feel that my feedback would go anywhere with them. And so to avoid confrontation and potentially getting upset and making a scene, I just, I just kept it to myself. But that's a perfect example of what you're talking about with responsibility, empowering people. So tell me about your upbringing and how that influenced this whole mindset of sticking things out. Because you have a lot of stick to itness. Okay, yeah. It was my mother's side that was Asian. She's Chinese and my father's side is, is he grew up in uh, New York. You know, you're, you're very typical mixture of white Caucasian nationalities. But he grew up on a farm. And so I kind of got it from both sides. Because anyone who's ever worked on a farm knows that you can't be lazy on a farm. You can't. Because if you're lazy on a farm, guess what? Guess what you don't have? Dinner. You don't have dinner. And then just in Asian culture in general, basically, the way they view life is that if you don't work hard and become successful in whatever arena it is that you choose to pursue, then that's like a black mark on your family. Yeah, that's a black mark on your family. That's a black mark on your parents, the elders who raised you. That's a black mark on you as a human being. It's like you don't do that as an Asian. You just don't. So I kind of got it from both sides because on my white side, my dad was, he's one of those guys. And, and, and I think, I believe that you can learn something from everybody. 
So my dad was the quintessential ExxonMobil manager. He, he took the, the corporate track. I mean, it was like his life is, is exactly the perfect American you know, process. Grew up, got straight A's in, in high school, went to college, got straight A's, joined the ROTC, went, served in the military. I'm very proud of his service. You know, proud of all, I, I just want to say thank you to all the, all the military servicemen who, you know, for those of us civilians here, we can't even imagine what those guys have been through. But, um, but he gave military service, came back, went to grad school, got an MBA, all on scholarship because his grades were fantastic. Straight out of MBA program, got hired on as in human resources for ExxonMobil, worked there for the next 31 years, became a manager, was very, very diligent throughout his life in saving and, and, and not spending a dime outside of what he had to spend. And like I said, we, we grew up with hand-me-down clothes, ended up retiring at 53. Wow. And lived a very, very comfortable retirement and is continuing to live a very comfortable retirement. Now, again, kind of that, that kind of goes against the grain of what my article is about because I don't want to be a part of corporate America. But for him and his goals and aspirations, that fit what he was looking for. And so that's why I say if that's what you're looking for, you can be successful in that if that's what you're looking for. And he did that. And now he's living a very, very you know, a great lifestyle. He's got money in the bank. He doesn't have to worry about it. He's, you know, he retired at 53. And so from him, if I had to use one word to describe what I took away from my father was persistence, just an unreal amount of persistence. It was like, you could give this guy, you could tell this guy to sharpen 600,000 pencils and he could do it no problem. He just sit there sharpening pencils. I mean, he, he was persistent to the point that he could literally do anything, not because of raw talent, but because he simply would not stop until it was done. And that's what I picked up from my dad. And, and he was never the kind to get discouraged. I, I don't, I'm sure if I, you know, I'm sure there was a point in his life where he experienced discouragement, but I never saw it. I always viewed him as like, you know, he'd go to work and he'd come home and I'd be like, man, this dude is going to work, sitting in traffic and it doesn't even phase him. I mean, it phases me just thinking about it, but he was just the definition of persistence. And then there was my mom, and that's where I got my dreamer side. She was the dreamer. She grew up in Hong Kong, uh, you know, originally Taiwan, moved to Japan. Her family fell on hard times. They ended up moving to Hong Kong. Uh, you know, they, they were wealthy in Japan, but there was some issues there, and uh, they ended up in Hong Kong with very, very little money. Lived in a tiny, tiny little apartment. When she was a teenager, so she was like 13 at the time, ended up, she had full personality, ended up getting a job as a radio show host in, in Hong Kong. So she did that and loved it. She loved the, the arts of any kind. She loved to dance. She loved to sing. She just... She was a creative. She was a creative, an absolute 100% creative. Ended up deciding to go to, to come to America for college. She came to America. She joined the Young Ambassadors, ended up becoming a perform, one of the, a member of that performing group, toured the world. Uh, doing song and dance performances. She also did a stint out at BYU Hawaii for a while where she joined Showcase Hawaii, which was another performing group out there. So, I mean, th she was a part of the first group that, the, that went on the USO tour to Russia. She went on the first tour to China when, when there had never been a religiously affiliated group in China before in, you know, as, with them as a communist nation. BYU's Young Ambassadors were the first group to, to first religiously affiliated group to enter China. She was a part of that group. Ended up getting married. She had, she had a bachelor's degree, a master's degree. She went through the whole thing. She was one of the most talented people in the world in terms of just absolute brain power, but she loved the arts. She absolutely loved the arts. She was a creative. And got married, had kids, started a family, did the whole stay-at-home mom thing, drove her crazy. So she ended up signing up with a modeling agency. Started modeling because she thought, well, I'm in Houston. I'm there's not a whole lot of Asians here at the time, particularly in Kingwood. We were probably one of the only three Asian families. Wow. So I started modeling, became successful at that. Thought, well, shoot, I, if I can model, I can act. So she started acting. She ended up uh, getting a role in RoboCop 2. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. Which, by the way, uh, when, when she got selected for the role after her audition, she, she told them, you know, I don't want to participate if it's going to be a rated R movie because I don't, you know, I don't want that, I don't want to be a part of of something that's extremely violent or, or explicit. And the director was like, oh, no, 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 no. This is, 
um, PG, definitely PG. We're not going to have, you know, it, this, is a, this is a movie that anyone can watch. And she said, okay, okay, great, great. So she brought us. We get on, to, we get on set the first, time, first day of their shooting um, with her scene involved. We get there, and I've never heard so many F words in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and she stomped right up, up, to, the, up to the producers, and, the, and she said, they told me this wasn't going to be, you know, R-rated. And this is definitely R-rated. People's, you know, they had the, the little brain matter packets that, you know, on people's heads that would explode when they got shot. And blood was flying everywhere. And I was, I was super little sitting there in my pajamas, my eyes as big as cue balls, just like, what is happening? <laughs> and, um, but anyways, she, she, because she had committed, she ended up finishing it, uh, did, did the scene. If, if you've seen Robocop 2, it's the scene at the beginning where Robocop, he does a drug bust on this drug factory, and it's run by a bunch of Chinese workers who are producing the drugs. And at one point, there's an Asian lady who has a baby, and the, the bad guy steals the baby from the Asian lady, and Robocop has to confront the bad guy to, to get the baby back because the bad guy's holding the baby hostage. Well, that's my mom's baby in the movie. She's the woman who's crying next to the bad guy, hoping that Robocop will save the baby. And her lines are all in Chinese because, you know, that was her role. But anyway, the point is that, that she had this passion for the arts. And so she ended up bringing my sister and I to modeling and acting. And we did commercials and we did, you know, uh, modeling gigs here and there. I ended up getting a gig with Shell Gasoline where I was, uh, I did a dare to say no to drugs advertisement with a police officer and they had, my face was plastered all over the Shell gas stations above the pumps, which is funny because I now work for Shell. What I picked up from her was if I could sum it all up into one phrase, and we've all heard this phrase, every child who grew up in the 80s and 90s has heard this phrase, but I don't believe that every child really believed it. What she would say is, you can become anything if you're willing to work hard for it. And that stuck with me. You can become anything. Like I said, we've all heard that. It's not, it's not a new phrase. She didn't make it up. The difference was I believed it. But somewhere along the line, because of the influence of traditional society, I never stopped believing it. But for a period of time, I forgot it. And I started telling myself that in order to be successful, I had to have a steady job. I had to have a good wage. I had to make a good hourly income so that I could buy a nice house, so that I could have a nice TV. And if I did that, then I would be able to label myself as successful. And I set aside the things that she had told me that I could become anything if I was willing to work for it. And I'm not willing to set that aside any longer. And that's why, that's, that's essentially why I wrote this article. And I'm not willing to watch other people set that aside any longer. And so I appreciate my father and his persistence, his example of absolute dedication and, and diligence. I appreciate my mother for her love of the arts and love and her passion for life and passion for refusing to accept anything less than the best that you are, you're able to give. And it's because of those two things that, that I do believe that, that there is a way out, a responsible and, and reasonable way out at the same time, given the liabilities that I have, like I said. But there is a way out, and, it, and it's a lot faster than, than we're, we're necessarily willing to accept. That's phenomenal. Thank you. So the last section that you go into here, now the actual point of this post, you really hit on it here. I think one reason I wanted to interview you about this is because, number one, I don't like doing phone interviews. I remember years ago I was part of a podcast network that I helped to create. We were able to get a lot of people listening to our content and downloading them. The largest number that we had, we went from 2.1 million downloads. The next year we did 4.3 million downloads in the 12-month calendar year. So my point is we used to do a lot of phone interviews, and I, I, I don't like that. There's not the energy that you get when you're in person talking and that feedback of all the other stuff that happens. One reason I wanted to get with you about this is because there's something you and I share with other people that I, I have an affinity with, you know, with Clifford, he's one of these people as well. We see our, our time in, on earth as stewards that we have, an, we have an obligation, but most importantly, we have an opportunity to leave this place a better place than what we found it, or perhaps to clean up the space a little bit and leave it presentable in, in a better condition than what we found it, right, than what we inherited. Now, I love how you go into this. You talk about uh, your commission to people is go live, be passionate, be motivated, be hungry, be driven, be relentless in the pursuit of your potential. You say go start new businesses, go back to school. So you, you say all these things, but there's this awakening that happens to us. You know, they say transitionally in society, in modern developed countries that we, that we, um, you know, men will go through a midlife crisis between their 40s and 60s. They'll both go out and buy a, a Cadillac or like a convertible or a Corvette or something. My father-in-law just bought a 
a Goldwing, a Honda Goldwing for like $3,000. Yeah, those big old motorcycles. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You know, but I look at him, you know, he's a barber. His whole dream for his daughter was to go finish college, get a good job, you know, so that one day she can have her retirement. Because it's the whole delayed gratification. Oh, we talked about that on the phone. This whole delayed delayed gratification, you mentioned It's a lie. It. It's a lie. And let me tell you why, David, is because delayed gratification as a concept is absolutely a truth. And it's something that we should all be practicing in every aspect of our life. You know, there's a study that a lot of people mention, and, and I find it, I have to laugh to myself when I hear people in corporate America, in management meetings, using this example. But there was a study done where they put a marshmallow in front of the child. And they told the child, if you cannot touch that marshmallow for X number of minutes, then I'll give you two marshmallows. And then they would leave the room and see what the children do. They say, okay, well, some children took the marshmallow, some had the discipline to wait for the second for, in order to get the two marshmallows. They followed these kids, and later on in life, the ones who were able to wait to get two marshmallows ended up becoming more successful in whatever they pursued than the people, than the children who took the first marshmallow. And I've heard that so many times yeah. in corporate America. And, and that study is absolutely true. The concept of delayed gratification is absolutely true, but the idea of implementing that in corporate America is a lie. You can't exercise delayed gratification in corporate America. Well, why? Well, everyone says, oh, well, you know, it's delayed gratification. I am, I'm stashing away 4% of my weekly paycheck into a 401k that's going to hopefully build over time, especially hopefully as long as the economy doesn't crash because I'm investing in other people's businesses and not my own. And then at some point when I'm 65, 70 years old, I'll have amassed enough wealth in those investments to produce some kind of passive income so that I can retire and live a lifestyle that will not be at the level that I was living when I retired, but it'll be some percentage of that level so that I can actually maintain a lifestyle that is somewhat comfortable. Maybe I'll travel a little bit, maybe I'll see my kids a little bit, and then I'll be able to pay for my own funeral. And if I'm lucky, I'll have a little bit left over to pass down to my children as inheritance. And they, they call that delayed gratification. But what is that really? What is that really? What does that look like to a college student and why is it a lie? And you're probably scratching your head like, why is that a lie? How is that not delayed gratification? Well, let me tell, tell you this. If you're coming out of college, what are you looking to do? You're looking to get, quote unquote, the best job you can and make the most money you can. But that's interesting because when you show up at, for day one at your new brand new stinking job, at your brand new stinking company with stars in your eyes and you show up, you have no experience, you have no skill set beyond a piece of paper that the, the university gave you, which university has no experience at the company, you know, in the field that the company is, is hiring you for. And that piece of paper just says, well, this guy has shown, has proven to us that he can learn stuff. And so we're going to give him our stamp of approval. And so go ahead and hire him because we believe he's capable of learning things. And so you get hired on with no experience. And two weeks later, after you put in 80 hours of work, you get a very sizable paycheck. In fact, a paycheck that's pretty darn close to the guy who's working that job who's been there for 20 years. Now, think about that. You instantly, I mean, literally, it doesn't get any more instant than that. You instantly, the moment you get hired, start getting paid very nearly the same as the guy who's been there for 20 years. If there is anything in this world that is instant gratification, that is it. Now let's talk about, let's use the, the example of an entrepreneur. Someone who comes out of college with the same piece of paper saying they know how to learn stuff. And instead of going for the instant paycheck, the instant piece of paper that says, okay, now you qualify for a house. You can go buy yourself a house. You can go buy yourself a car. You can go buy yourself all these things. You can go create all these liabilities for yourself that's only gonna bind you further down to the corporate handcuffs because then you'll become reliant upon that paycheck for the next 50 years. Or you can say, you know what? I'm gonna put off the car. I'm gonna put off the house. Heck, I'm gonna put off the TV and I'm gonna put off cable. I'm gonna put off movies. I'm gonna put off a bi-weekly bi paycheck so that I can build something. And I'm gonna take three to four years of eating ramen to build something that I'm passionate about because I believe that in three to five years, once I get through that learning curve and once I have established a foundation, then I will reap the rewards of my delayed gratification. And when those rewards start coming, let me tell you, it's not gonna be a 2% raise every year. It grows exponentially when you lay the foundation right. 
And that's what I'm in the process of doing now at 34, which I wish I had done at 22. But I can't sit here and say, oh, well, if only I was 22. I can say, well, it's not going to be when I'm 35. It's going to be right now. That you got to make the choice. That's the difference between people who succeed and people who don't, is that they don't look back and they don't say, well, if only I had known these things when I was 20. They say, I know them now. And I'm going to act on them now so that I'm not sitting here when I'm 40 looking back and saying, I wish I had done it when I was 20. I wish I had done it when I was 25. I wish I had done it when I was 35. But when you exercise delayed gratification like that, not with the vision that someday you will have amassed enough income over your 2% cost of living adjustments for the next 40 years. When you see delayed gratification is that I'm going to give up things that I want right now that, are, that, that the world is saying I can have instantly through financing and through a bi-weekly paycheck. I'm going to give up on those things right now so that I can have true wealth later on. Not only wealth financially, but wealth emotionally in terms of fulfillment, in terms of my life's legacy. And there's a word that, that I want to touch on in a second. Legacy. If you're willing to delay the things of this world for a little while to build a foundation of something great, then before you know it, you'll be living the dream instead of dreaming the dream. And here I am, having worked in corporate America for coming up on 10 years, still dreaming the dream that I'm finally realizing has been within my reach this whole time. But I, I wasn't willing to delay my gratification long enough to say, I don't need the paycheck right now. I'd rather have the investment in my future so that I can reap the rewards in three years. And before we get too far on, I don't, sure. I don't want to take your train of thought, but, but mention that word legacy. And I, I mentioned in there too that a lot of the, the misconception of society is that you know, hopefully we've amassed enough income and wealth that when we die, we can pass a little bit of it on to our kids. Now, let me ask you, David, because you're kind of like me. If you say you get to heaven, let's just pretend here, sure. you go to the pearly gates and someone says, you know, what, what did you leave? What mark did you leave on the world? And you, you puff your chest out and you say, I left, I left $500,000 to each of my kids. Okay. Well, that's what we call an inheritance. So you left your kids an inheritance. The next question, David, what legacy did you leave? Because to me, you can't measure a legacy in dollars and cents. What legacy did you leave in the world? And if you're struggling to figure out what you left in the world other than things that can be counted on a spreadsheet, then maybe the legacy is a little bit lacking. And that's what really drew me to this point was looking at my life and looking at my cubicle and my little three by five picture of my, my sons sitting on my desk that wouldn't be there in the next few years because the corporate world is moving to a, to a open floor design where everyone just has, everyone's mobile, they just have a laptop and they plop down at whatever desk is open. That's, what, that's the way most companies are going. They're, get, they're even getting away, they're downgrading from cubicles going to open floor concepts, which is crazy. So you can't even have a picture on your desk anymore. But at the time, I'd look at my picture on my desk of my children, I'd say, you know what? When my kids grow up and are questioning in themselves the things that I'm trying to teach them of be all you can be, and they're seeking motivation, and they, they face discouragement and adversity, and they're seeking motivation, are they going to look at me and say, I'm motivated to work hard because I want to be better than what my dad had? Or are they going to look at me and say, I want to work hard because I want to be just like my dad? And I kind of had to sit back and do a self-inventory at that point and say, right now, given the life that I live and given the, the situation that I'm in, I would be embarrassed if my kids looked at me and wanted the exact same thing. And so I said, if I want to make a legacy, if I want to leave a legacy with my children, it's time for me to make a change. Powerful. I've often thought that uh, children are like light bulbs. Somehow they came into our lives, and uh, but they seem to illuminate us. I, I've experienced that too. That's neat. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, it's very, very few times am I able to say that I actually captured, that we were able to capture audibly something that goes beyond a clever video 
or a really cool audio book, but something that actually is lasting. And the things you talked about, the principles, the, the thought that you provoke, the feelings that come that accompany those thinkings is it's lasting. And this is part of, this is where legacies begin through inspiration. So Terry, I want to thank you. Tell you what, will you do us a favor? Will you read the last, that your closing, your closing paragraph there? Will you read Absolutely. that? Absolutely. So this is the, cl the closing paragraph of the, the article that I wrote on the blog. But this is, if there's anything that I wanted people to read in this article, it was this. It was this, this admonition at the end. Go start new businesses. Go back to school. Go chase a career or job as long as you know that's what you really want. Go learn a trade. Go explore the world. Go write books. Go sing and dance on Broadway. Go invent something new. Go be a missionary. Go make the world a better place. Go and don't be afraid to fail. Go and be willing to fail until you succeed. Heck, go join an MLM if you feel like it. But whatever you do, just do it with all your heart. And trust me, if you take the time beforehand to find something you are passionate about, you'll realize that doing it with all your heart really isn't all that hard. Good content, man. Excellent. Terry, thank you. Always a pleasure, man. Appreciate you. Yeah, thank you. So they can go to the hyphen serial hyphen hobbyist.com that's right that's the name of the blog um i also have an instagram at the underscore serial underscore hobbyist.com the hyphens were taken on that one um, so underscores for instagram hyphens for the website and yeah if you like what you see subscribe if you don't subscribe that's cool too it's you know i'm not doing this to try to take over the blogging universe. I'm doing this because I hope for one person to read it. And if that one person reads it, then my, my work here is done. So, so if you're that person, come on, come read it. If you got comments, bring them. If you don't like it and you don't like what you see, well, go find a different blog. And also another thing, if you want, if you want Terry to build something for you, <laughs> <laughs> it's a great way to reach out to him because I, he'll even appreciate the thought. I know his head will be thinking about things Awesome. Well, we'll go ahead and cut it now. Thanks, Terry. Uh, keep listening for more great content.